welcome to the Ice Guys, brought to you by the National Hockey Now Network. This is the show that takes you into the world of the National Hockey League. Every game, every day, from a betting perspective. With pro sports handicappers, Ian Cameron, Alex B. Smith, and various guests from the world of hockey and sports betting. And now, here's your host, Ian Cameron. Welcome to the Ice Guys, presented by National Hockey Now. Monday, June 5th, Ian Cameron, Alex B. Smith. We've got Kevin Beach with us. It's a full house. And we're pleased to announce that we've got Paul Romanuk, legendary, longtime NHL and hockey play-by-play broadcaster for well over 20 years he was doing it, uh, joining us here on the Ice Guys show. Paul, it is great to have you with us. How are you doing? I am doing very well. It's great to be here. Always love talking a little bit of hockey, uh, even at this time of year. You know, we, we could be talking about maybe baseball, being outside in the sun. Season's still going, but let's talk about it. Some uh, some great matchups. Yeah, we'll definitely get into some Stanley Cup final game two talk uh, and a little general NHL talk with Paul later in the show. But we got to start with this, I think, terrific career that uh, Paul Romanuk had. Uh, and we'll start at the very beginning. You know, Kevin Beach. His Twitter handle is good because on his Twitter account, it says uh, Canadian playing hockey for a living. How original. Uh, and it's uh, <laughs> it's so true. And for you, Paul, I'm sure it was growing up watching Hockey Night in Canada as a young Canadian kid and seeing the games on Saturday nights with the Hewitts, Foster and Bill and Danny Gallivan and maybe a young Bob Cole, who, of course, came along in the late 70s. In 80s for you, it was probably a young Canadian kid wanting to become a hockey broadcaster, possibly at some point. How original. So talk about how you got into uh, broadcasting and wanting to get into that. Obviously, the love of hockey probably at the root of it. Yeah, like uh, like any kid my age growing up in southern Ontario, I grew up in Oshawa. Uh, you, you lived, eat slept breathed hockey uh you know a lot of road hockey back in those days uh all the usual things you read the hockey news from cover to cover at newspaper kids you should uh, check one out sometime uh none of this online stuff of course it didn't exist you collect what's cards that? what's that? <laughs> you, you collected hockey cards the whole well you know what i'm trying to say is you were just immersed in the game and uh, I suppose I probably started off doing play-by-play the way many other play-by-play announcers did. And that was during road hockey, I would call the play-by-play. Uh, and I guess maybe the only twist on that was I would oftentimes do it while I was playing. Uh, goal or uh, or out, as you called it. And uh, that's kind of how I got started. And then watching the games... I think what really, really shaped it for me, uh, my broadcast hero is a guy named Danny Gallivan. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with him, Danny was the play-by-play English language voice of the Montreal Canadiens and Hockey Night in Canada back in the 70s when they had all those great teams. And where I lived in Oshawa, uh, this was back in the uh, the pre-satellite, pre-cable days, you had an antenna to pick up television. And if you had a really fancy antenna, then you could aim it in the direction of, you know, where the signal was coming from to get a better signal. So in Oshawa on a Saturday night, if you aim the antenna towards Toronto, you got the CBC local Toronto broadcast, which was, of course, always the Leafs. Leafs weren't so good back then. They were okay. If you aimed it the other way towards Peterborough, the east of Oshawa, you got the national broadcast, which back in those days was always the Montreal Canadiens because they were great. And you heard the great duo of Danny Gallivan and Dick Irvin. And uh, to me, uh, I just fell in love with the craft of play-by-play broadcasting. They were as big a part of that team to me as a little kid as Guy Lafleur, uh, you know, uh, Doug Risebrow, Ken Dryden, Steve Shutt, Larry Robinson. They were part of the team. And uh, that's where I fell in love with the craft. Yeah, I I love Danny Gallivan's style of play-by-play personally, like someone that I was only born in 1985. I'll be 40 in a couple of years. Um, but definitely I enjoyed his play-by-play style paraphernalia. We had never heard that word used before uh, to describe, uh, you know, the goaltender's wardrobe, if you will. Uh, Danny Gallivan did that. Uh, and to me, the closest comparison modern day to um, Danny Gallivan in terms of just style was the recently retired Doc Emmerich. You know, Doc was very, very much in that same style. I was always amazed, Paul, with Doc Emmerich. He would use like 80 different words seriously to describe the movement of the puck, careened, lobbed, pitchforked, spirited, yep. foisted, 
nub, drub. I mean, sky hooked. I mean, it went on and on and on about the different kind of words and his just use of vocabulary. It, he's gifted with it. Absolutely gifted with it. And Danny Gallivan had a lot of that in him, too. Yeah, I mean, to me, Danny was the pioneer in, in that uh, sort of, uh, for lack of a better description, loquacious style of describing things. Uh, I suppose in another sport, an analogy uh, or or somebody who would be similar, uh, any uh, big NFL fans who are of my vintage, if you go back far enough, there was a guy named Howard Cosell. Uh, and he was more of a color commentator, but again, he, he used the language like a tool. Uh, and he used words well to describe things. Things, and it made him stand out from everybody else. And, uh, you know, it, it's a taste thing for sure. Uh, I know the odd time when I would throw in, uh, you know, a big word, you'd get the usual hate on Twitter. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, people aren't, aren't ready for it. So, again, it's, it's a taste thing. But for me, I prefer that type of broadcaster. Yeah, I think it is. I think, like I say, that's why I love Doc. Plus, he was just exciting. I think he was going to have a heart attack every great scoring chance there was. He was into it. You were always that way, too, and we'll we'll get into that more. You were always had energy, passion, enthusiasm, uh, with especially as there was that great chance, that great save, that big goal. Uh, you all, It was not a muted uh, play-by-play call by you at any point. It was always into it, enthused, excited about it. Uh, and that's what was great. So you did some Oshawa Generals. You know, you did some, I think, radio for them, correct? That's uh, in the 80s. Yep. You were their voice for a little bit. How did then, because I know in the 80s, that's when you got your in, if you will, with Hockey Night in Canada, at least from a behind the scenes standpoint, you got to work there. How did that get uh, done for you? Uh, I was just finishing up at uh, what was then Ryerson uh, University, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I was looking all over the place for work. I was going to be a, a freelance broadcaster and, and do a bunch of different things, which I did. Uh, but one of the places, uh, because I knew some people who were also interning there, uh, was um, what was then called Canadian Sports Network, CSN. Uh, and it was in the uh, it was in the McLaren advertising building on Young Street, just around the corner from what was then Ryerson. And I went in there and I met a guy named Doug Beforth, who was a senior producer at the time. And, uh, you know, said, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd like to come and work for you guys. Uh, it was very much, you know, I knew they weren't going to go, hey, you want to call the game next Saturday night? Uh, I was a pretty young guy and I did have some play-by-play experience, but I was certainly new in my play-by-play career. And he said, well, you know, we've got a runner position that's open. Would you be interested in that? Yes, sir, I would. And I ended up working there for a few years as a runner, uh, which is just a fancy word for, you know, uh, basically a gopher. Uh, I did everything from stats uh, for Bob Cole. Uh, I did stats for Dave Hodge. I would get the guy's coffee. I would run things around. You'd go and get the three stars and and hold them as they were coming off the ice at the end of the game. You'd bring intermission guests in, uh, make sure they had a towel and a cold glass of water. Uh, And it was a great, great learning position. I worked around some amazing people uh, like Dave Hodge and like Brian McFarlane and uh, like Bob Cole and some great broadcasters and that was my entry into hockey night and from that time it it was like every canadian broadcaster who puts on a headset to call hockey no matter what their age uh your dream is to call hockey night in canada on a saturday night that's the ultimate that's the you know that is the nhl stanley cup final of play-by-play broadcasting in canada in my opinion and that really lit the fire for me uh, having that job yeah, having that job, which you had, of course, in the uh, 80s. And you mentioned at the time why Hockey Night in Canada loved the Canadians. The Canadians were great in the 70s. It tailed off a little in the 80s, but Toronto was not good for that entire era. 70s and 80s and the whole Harold Ballard uh, ownership tenure of the Leafs was pretty much disastrous in terms of on-ice results for the Leafs. And it's worth checking out, by the way, the Harold Ballard uh, documentary. We've talked about it a couple of times on this show. It's a really good retrospective, if you will. Uh, about the way the Leafs were uh, at that time. It's funny you mentioned Dave Hodge because in preparing for this interview, you were apparently on site and right there seeing it firsthand, the Dave Hodge pen flip uh, in 1987. And Dave Hodge, obviously, and uh, this was just one of the most surreal moments I think we can remember in, you know, in a Canadian uh, television sports broadcast, in my opinion, with what we saw. And um, I'm going to bring up the clip right now of it. 
I always laugh my ass off every time I see it. Uh, and I fully agree. I a hundred percent get where Dave Hodge is coming from uh, with this. This was back in 87. Uh, the Canadians and the flyers were going to an overtime game. I believe it was in March. So it wasn't even a over a playoff overtime game. I believe it was just, was that right? It was a regular right. season. Yeah, It was a regular game. late in the regular season. Yeah, correct. So this would have been a five minute overtime. So it's not like it's a big freaking deal. If we stay on the air a little bit longer, you know, to show the overtime coast to coast on hockey night in Canada, but CBC behind the scenes insisted they get off the air before the end of that game for the 11 PM <clears> local <throat> news and Dave Hodge on the air found out they were doing this, and he was not very happy about it. Take a look. This is an icon. Uh, Montreal and the Philadelphia Flyers are currently playing overtime, and uh, are we able to go there or not? We are not able to go there. That's the way things go today in uh, sports and this network. <laughs> and uh, the Flyers and the Canadians have us in suspense, and will remain that way until we can find out somehow who won this game or who's responsible for the way we do things here good night for hockey night in canada <laughs> isn't that something that was <laughs> hilarious iconic and remember this is 1987 so we have a lot of younger people watching this and listening to the ice guys on a daily basis there's no let's go on twitter let's dial up nhl.com no. and find out what the score is and and find and keep on ta uh, on on track and keep tabs of what's going on and how this game finishes. There's no way of doing that back in 1987. Paul, talk about that that because you were working there at the time. Just a, 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 a unbelievable moment because you just it was so unexpected and you don't usually hear someone working for a network go off the cuff and just rip them for a decision they've made. Well, I was, uh, you know, I don't know how much time you have, but the, it was a, a fascinating thing to witness. That shot that you just showed your viewers, listeners, uh, if uh, if the camera panned just to Dave's left, panned to the right, so camera right, uh, I was sitting right there. Um, I was doing stats for Dave. My job on that particular night was, uh, and it, it, you know, it was, again, it was 1987 technology. Uh, so you didn't, have access to all of the other games going on the way you do now. Uh, it wasn't technically possible. So it was a fairly big deal. Hockey Night in Canada being the biggest, uh, the biggest show in Canada in terms of sports is what they started to do at that time is they would have a couple of games uplinked satellite uh, coming into uh, CBC master control and I would be able to watch them and it would be the update game for that night. So that particular night, it was the Montreal Philadelphia game. And my job would be to watch that game and there'd be a goal. Dave would be watching the Toronto game on, on our broadcast. And I turn and I say, Dave goal in Montreal. And he go, oh, you know, how is the goal scored? Chelios knocked it down just inside the blue line, took a couple steps to the high slot, wired one low glove corner. Okay. All right. And then they'd rack it back and he'd do it cold. He wouldn't get to see it first. So then there'd be a break in play and Bob Cole would be, you know, and that one uh, covered up face off down to the left of Riggett. And now an update. Here's Dave Hodge. And oh, goes, baby. Oh, for sure. Oh, baby. Yeah. And then da, 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 the music would go and Dave would go, you know, well, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, update for Montreal. And the Canadians are on the board. Watch Chris Chelios Knox. And he would, you know, give the description I'd given him. So I'll tell you that to tell you the rest of the story. That's why I was sitting there. And at the end, what, what had happened earlier in the day is the Briar had been on. I want to say it was the semifinals of the Briar. Uh, probably because the final would have been on Sunday and Hodge and Bob Cole were sitting in the green room and they were watching and CBC did the classic CBC thing back then. Again, this is before the days of sports networks. Uh, you know, it, it was, you know, TSN was a fledgling. They didn't have a, a big presence, uh, in the world at that point. So CBC was it in terms of sports, but on CBC, it was absolutely sacrosanct that you had to get off the air for local news at six o'clock because local news was the biggest revenue generator for the local stations, right? You know, you're the, you're the, the local guy in swift current and the six o'clock news is coming on and you've got, uh, you know, Fred's car warehouse and, uh, Burt's pest control, and you've got all your local sponsors. That's where you make your money. So you had to be off the air no matter what. 
Likewise, 11 o'clock was a huge revenue generator for the what was then the national, the 11 o'clock news. So when, you know, it now they so they got off the air for the briar. They they dropped out of it in extra ends, I think. So Cole and Hodge lose it. You know, what the hell? This is out of a guy. And and curling it, is a big friggin' deal in Canada. Big deal. Well, national. and Bob curled in the briar. So yes. he, you know, he, yeah. he had an even uh, even more of a, an interest. So anyway, that happens. On goes the day. Leaf game ends early, which it usually did. And uh, the producer of the show, a guy named Doug Sellers, uh, rest his soul, no longer with us. Uh, and Doug says, OK, Haji, we're going to go to because I had a headset on like this and I could hear what was going on in the truck, as well as, of course, what's going on in the studio. He says, OK, Haji, what we're going to do, uh, our game's over. We'll do three stars, blah, blah, blah. You're going to throw to the uh, Montreal Philadelphia game and we're going to go there for like bonus coverage. OK, fine. Montreal, I think, as memory serves correct, was leading by a goal or maybe Philadelphia was one team had a lead. Game gets tied late in the game. So now it's like, oh, shit, we're going to have to dump out of this. You know, so Hodge jumps on and says to the producer, he goes, don't tell me that I've got to go on and tell people that for the second time in a day, we're going to dump out of a game to go to news. Don't make me do that. You know, which was completely reasonable and unreasonable. I get where he was coming from. And history has shown him to be absolutely correct in his stance. However, was rule number one was CBC at the time. Get out for news. Yeah. I don't care what it is. You got to get out at 11 o'clock and get yes. the news on, period. Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I, I agreed with what he was what, with what he was doing. Uh, but on the other hand, you're the host of the show, you know, and hosts don't produce hosts, host and producers produce. That's the way the chain of command works. Uh, just like, uh, you know, I'm sure Kevin could tell you, hey, goalies don't coach. Goalie stop pucks, the coach coaches. That's how it works. And uh, so the coach, in this case, the producer said, Dave, like my hands are tied. You know, we got it. We're going to come out of break. You got to tell people, sorry, we can't show them the end of the game. We have to we have to go for news. So essentially, as my memory recalls it, Hodge says, well, don't put me on camera. I don't want to do that. Just just end the show, which, of course, you can't do. And so Sellers puts his foot down and says, Dave, here's what you're the host. Here's what's happening. We're coming on camera or you're doing the out of town scoreboard. You're coming on camera. You're going to explain things to people and you're going to say good night. So we come out of the break. They run the highlights. They run through the out of town scoreboard. Hodge comes on camera. And then what you saw happen, happened. And the show ended. And again, it's a long time ago. But to my memory, the show ended. Dave got up. Uh, walked over to a coat rack, which was by the door over by the client room. He put on his coat. He looked back in the studio and said, see you later. And he walked out the door. And that was, uh, he's, you know, he literally walked out the door and he also walked out of his hockey night in Canada career. That was it. That was it. And he quit. They didn't fire him. He quit. Now that apparently they made try to make him apologize and he yeah. wasn't having any of that. He says, yeah. none of that shit. Fuck it. I'm out of here uh, essentially at that point. And that's it. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, what's funny about that, Paul is Dave Hodge's, uh, resignation from Mocky Night in Canada. If, if that whole incident doesn't happen in that day with the briar getting cut off for news and the Canadians flyers overtime getting cut off for news and Dave Witz, Hockey Night in Canada, do we even see Ron McLean's era? Do we see D coach's corner with Ron and Don all these years? Cause guess who the, uh, the successor was. Yeah. Ron well, McLean. it was. Yeah. It was Dave and uh, Don. Uh, Coach's Corner had already started, and it was less like it was in later years. Uh, it was a little more uh, serious is probably how I'd describe it. Uh, but, yeah, Ron McLean at that time was the midweek Leaf host. Uh, he did the midweek games. He had gotten his start hosting Calgary Flames games because uh, a guy named John Shannon, very talented producer at the time, had seen Ron doing weather on a station in Red Deer. And said, this guy's really talented. So they got him doing Flames games. And then, of course, Toronto being the center of the, the broadcast universe, it was, we should bring him in to do the Leafs midweeks. So he was doing Leafs midweek games on CHCH TV at the time. Uh, and uh, Hodge. Backyard. Yeah. yeah, there you go. And Hodge did what he did. And, yes, that absolutely opened the door. They, you know, they needed a host 
for <laughs> Hockey Night in Canada. And uh, Ron was doing a great job on the local show. He was right there. And uh, Ron McLean, uh, I'm sure he sends Dave a Christmas card every year. I hope. <laughs> he damn well should. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, I don't get that position in that chair uh, without uh, your little incident, your little tiff that night. Uh, in 1987, just unbelievable stuff. Alex, can you imagine if you're a Blackhawks fan? Let's say you're your age right now. You're a Blackhawks fan, 1987. You have no other access to the Blackhawk game on television, but say one network. Uh, say there's a CBC equivalent. There's no NBC Sports Chicago back then. There's no regional network in Chicago back then for you as a Blackhawks fan. You're anxious and you're awaiting them to go because they said it to overtime of this game. And it's a big game late in the regular season. And then they all of a sudden tell you, we're not showing you the end of the game and you're left in suspense and you can't go anywhere to check scores like you can today back yep. in 1987. That would be, that's, that's totally absurd. You'd be absolutely livid, right? Well, he, well, here's the thing that wouldn't have happened in Chicago in 1987 because none of the home games were broadcast anyway. So we wouldn't have had the first or second period to begin with, let alone yeah. the third or, or overtime. So, but, uh, but that is just a crazy thing to think of. And it's funny. I look up the score of that game. It ended in a three, three tie. So <laughs> people didn't really miss anything, you know, but, but it's just the principle of it. And uh, like I said, you know, now having, you know, sports at our fingertips, literally, uh, those things won't happen. But they're, uh, it's interesting to see how, you know, it's basically like Canada's version of the Bambi game here in the States where they, you know, pulled that in the, with CBS in the 60s. So it's just, just interesting to see, go back in time and see those uh, tidbits of how, you know, media and sports have changed. Yeah, if you can put up with the pop-up ads, nowadays, if television's not showing me the game I want, I can get a free live video stream somewhere. And I'll be able to watch the end of the game somewhere. Uh, that's the way it is. But that's just an absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, and I had to bring that up because that Dave Hodge uh, thing is still, you know, even it was 36 years ago now, uh, just an incredible moment. So eventually you get your next break, Paul, and it's TSN, uh, obviously. Late 80s, I think 89, I believe, uh, is when you uh, started there. Uh, and then you ended up working up the ranks again. And, uh, you know, you started out, I think, as the secondary voice of NHL on TSM. Gosh darn, that Jim Houston guy, man. I mean, you're number two behind that guy. The two different networks, two different eras it ended up being uh, over the course of time. But uh, you started there at Hockey Night in Canada. Uh, you ended up, because Jim ended up moving on. Uh, he was doing Blue Jays, Jim Houston. He was doing uh, NHL on TSN, early 90s. I remember how good the Blue Jays were, uh, of course, in the 90s. The two World Series that they won, Jim Houston with Buck Martinez. I'd watch them. Uh, growing up doing baseball, he was the lead voice of hockey, but you were also part of the NHL on TSN coverage. You then become the lead guy, I believe in 93 it was. Uh, and then you're there for until 98. You do NHL with uh, Gary Green, one of my favorites. And I hope Gary's doing well, uh, Gary Green. I haven't seen seen or heard much from him in 10 or 15 years. He's kept a low profile, but uh, definitely one of my favorite duos back then was Paul Romanuk, Gary Green, the da 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 I love that old TSN theme, man. It was a really, really good intro that they had, especially in the first few years that they had the NHL coverage. So you did that. You got to do CHL and Memorial Cups. And, of course, we just had the Memorial Cup final last night, uh, Quebec beating uh, Seattle. You got to call some of those. You got to call many World Junior Hockey Championships, which is like uh, a, a kind of a big deal uh, here in Canada. Uh, it is basically a religion to watch the World Junior Hockey Championship at Christmas time every year. So you got to do that. And the funny thing about Paul in particular, when he did the work on the Junior Games and the World Junior Hockey Championship, Everybody, even the younger kids, know Bob McKenzie, right? Insider, supreme, legendary career as an insider, reporter, working on TSN in the studio uh, all these years, draft rankings, breaking news scoops, finding out who just got signed, who got traded, who got fired, just the incredible career Bob McKenzie had. But I'm sure the young kids may not know Bob McKenzie at a time with TSN was also color analyst in the broadcast booth for a period of time with none other than this guy. Paul Romanuk as his partner. So, Paul, talk about that era that you had with TSN uh, in the 90s. Well, Bob, uh, in, in terms of Bob, he was at that time working for the Hockey News as the uh, the editor, I believe. <clears throat> and uh, so he was around TSN because they had a, a it was called uh, Hockey News, the TV show. Kudos for the creative title. Uh, and uh, they had that going. And 
at the same time, TSN was launching a, uh, a broadcast, a weekly broadcast of CHL hockey, so junior hockey. And the idea was for the first time ever in Canadian television, we would do a game of the week from one of the cities from all three leagues. And uh, I was going to be the play by play guy actually had a role as the executive producer of the show with somebody else. Uh, and we'd gone and pitched it to TSN and it was going to be on the air there. So we were looking for a color commentator and Bob approached me and we talked about it. And Bob was a plugged in guy to junior hockey as well, both through his work at, uh, the hockey news. But before that, he was a reporter for the Sault Ste. Marie star and his beat was covering junior hockey. So long story short, Bob became a, a color guy first uh, and I was his first play by play partner. And we did junior hockey games, uh, Memorial cup, regular season games, playoff games for many years. Uh, and also the, the world junior championship. And uh, he was a, a lovely guy to work with. He's uh, still a friend now. And it was just the way life works. It was really strange. Uh, when I came back to work for Hockey Head in Canada and then was doing some regional Leafs games and his son, Sean McKenzie, was the host of those games. So I, uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the few who worked with both the dad and the son. And my memory of, of Sean, one of the first times I met him was at the World Junior Championship in I want to say Saskatoon or Red Deer and riding from one city to the next, sitting in the back seat with Sean and his younger brother, Mike, uh, while they wrestled and, uh, Bob, uh, sat in the front seat and drove the car with his, uh, with his wife, Cindy. So I've known Sean a long time. So it's funny how life works. Yeah, that's a, it's credible because Sean, you're right. just would have been a little baby, a little kid at that point in, in the nineties. Now he's grown into having another uh, great broadcasting career and getting involved in hockey, just like his uh, dad, uh, and you're probably thinking when you see Sean at Sportsnet in the, in the last decade in the 2010 area, you're probably saying the first thought is, man, holy shit, I'm getting old, you know, or I'm getting older <laughs> here a little bit. Just seeing Sean all grown up and working uh, television like that. Uh, just, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy, crazy how that works. We got to talk about a couple of these World Junior uh, experiences because I'm trying to remain, you got to go to some great places. I think Yavla, Sweden. One year, I believe, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, you got Saskatoon, Red Deer. That was an iconic World Junior, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, Boston, you know, there were many uh, different places you got to go to call the uh, World Juniors. But that Red Deer uh, World Juniors, just because of who was on that Canadian team that year, uh, they were an ex excellent, excellent. I think one of the better Canadian World Junior teams in my lifetime was that 95 Red Deer team. I mean, just a stacked lineup, Brian McCabe, there's Eric Daze, uh, Alex, uh, we'll know him, of course, he was a Chicago Blackhawk uh, draft pick, but that was a, uh, Marty Murray had a huge tournament, I remember that year for Canada uh, in Red Deer, just an excellent, excellent hockey team, dominated that tournament, and that was part of that great run, Paul, that you were be if privileged to call, was that five consecutive gold medals. Uh, for Canada at the World Junior Hockey Championship, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. And the great call that you made on the fifth one was the drive for five has arrived. Canada, World Junior Champions for the fifth year in a row. I think I got that word for word correct too, but it was just an outstanding call. Still remember it to this day 26 years ago. But calling that five consecutive Canadian World Junior Hockey Championship gold medals, it's got to be up there in terms of everything you did. It was the whole world junior experience was great. Um, you know, it, it, the tournament is hard. It's people find this hard to believe. But when I started doing the world junior hockey championship, the first one uh, that I called was 1991, I want to say. Uh, and I won't say people didn't know what it was, but hockey people did because it was heavily scouted back then as it is now. But the casual hockey fan wasn't really aware of it. It wasn't on TV in its entirety in Canada. Uh, you might see the odd game, uh, but it wasn't on the way it is now. Uh, it was, so, I mean, uh, a quick story is when I started doing the tournament, uh, I remember going over to Fusen, Germany was the first one I did overseas. And my wife having to explain to work colleagues that where I was over Christmas. Well, he's, he's at this hockey tournament. It's a world junior. What's that? Well, it's this tournament and they're all like junior hockey age players and they go and they play for, Oh really? I hadn't. So people weren't, it, it wasn't near the part of the culture in Canada that it is now. And, uh, TSN really put it on the map and I was lucky enough to be the play by play announcer for that. And I think it was twofold why it became as iconic as it is now for Canadian sports fans. 
Uh, number one, the time of the year, of course, uh, people are typically at home and they watch TV over the holidays, much like the Christmas time NBA matchup in the United States. Right. Like that's a big deal. People at home, you get big numbers. Uh, typically, the NBA will make sure that two of their marquee guys are playing on that Christmas Day matchup and so on. So it, it's kind of like that times the entire tournament in Canada. But the other thing that made it really big, I believe, is that Canada won. They, they finally had success at the tournament because up until around that time, they would go and they would win the odd time. Uh, other times they might finish third or they wouldn't win a medal. It wasn't this big success story and, and people didn't even see it. I mean, famously, one of the gold medals they won in, in Rochester, Minnesota, it wasn't even on television. Uh, was you know It wasn't broadcast, which is hard to believe now. So what happened is... Canada started to win and they won the at that time unprecedented five in a row that I was lucky enough to call. And hey, Canadians are front runners just like every other country when it comes to international sports. Uh, had Canada just been mediocre at that tournament the way they had been previously, I'm not saying it wouldn't have gotten bigger, but it wouldn't have been anything compared to, hey, let's click on the TV and watch Canada slaughter Norway 9-1 to one on Boxing Day. And it just turned into this, let's put them on and watch Canada win. And hey, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And it turned into this thing where you would turn it on and watch your country having success in an international tournament and it just kind of took off from there and uh, and you know quite honestly I, I think it's it's you know I love the tournament but I do get a little world juniored out at times uh, and I realize times have changed and I sound a little bit like old guy yelling at clouds but you know when we're starting to talk about uh, about the pre-selection camps in the summer and broadcasting the scrimmages uh, to me, it's, you know, it's, it's really hit a level that it was nowhere near when I was doing it. Maybe a bit of overkill. I don't know. That's for, uh, that's for viewers to decide, but it's a fantastic thing. And I was lucky enough to have a front row seat when it really, really took off. And, uh, it, it yeah, it was a real career highlight for sure. Ian. Yeah, it's they, fascinating to hear that too, being an American. And I never really knew about the world juniors until later on. And, and, you know, the first few years of me watching hockey, I just knew about the NHL and you know, minor leagues that were in, in North America, but didn't know much about how big junior hockey was in Canada and, and the whole structure of it. And so it's interesting to hear that that World Juniors, it wasn't this big event that it is now, even uh, going back as just, you know, 30 years ago. That That's you know, fascinating to yeah, it really it's a fairly, you know, again, depending on your age bracket, but but it is a when I was a kid, Alex, uh, I remember well when I was doing the Oshawa Generals games, Sherry Basson at the time was the general manager of the team. And he would also get uh, hired or recruited to be the general manager of Canada's national junior team. And I can remember Sherry going off to do games with the team uh, and he'd come back and he'd tell us about it because we didn't see them on TV. You know, he'd come back and tell you about, ah, you know, we were in Russia driving around and, and he'd, he'd tell you <laughs> stories about it. Uh, it was it was not the big deal that it is. Uh, and it's it's again, if you're if you're 20 years old, uh, probably even 30 years old, you find that hard to believe because it, it has been this this Christmas tradition in terms of sports television in this country, certainly since the mid 90s, I would say. And, and even to go back to this with NHL coverage, and this is something that me and Ian talked about this long time ago before this show even started about you know i just always assumed that even if there wasn't a you know your local team the leafs or, or the sins or the habs playing that there was just a hockey game on tv every night in Canada. i just always kind of just believed that was the case and that's certainly not based on what you're telling us no not at, i mean and again the, like is recently uh, recent to me but but you know in the you know in the the late 80s and into the early 90s there was no nhl center ice package uh you know some people bars might have had satellites where they could pull down games but your average you know your average schmuck at home didn't have a satellite where he could uh, downlink all of the games so it was it, you know if you want to go back to ancient history when i was a kid the games you saw were Saturday night on Hockey Night in Canada, the national game. And then you would also see a Wednesday night regional game if you were in southern Ontario. And if you were here where I grew up, you were lucky because you got to see Leafs regional midweek games as well as the Buffalo Sabres who were close by. Yeah. But if, if you know you lived in the prairie uh, out, out in western Canada, you saw one game a week and that was the game on Saturday night. It's wow. Now it's, it's remarkable. You're right. Yeah. Anywhere. I remember as a kid with the Leafs talking about the midweek. You're right. That's exactly what it was growing up for me. 
a very young kid. It was CBC Saturday night I'm in the Leaf region. We get CHCH and Global. Global Television Network would have Leaf Kid. You'd see Bowen and Harry Neal and Mark Hebsher and Jim Taddy and all those guys would be involved with that. That's that's going back a long time. That's a Gilmore Clark era, basically, in the uh, early 90s when they were uh, going to those conference finals. Too. That's it. That's it. You got like a couple of games a week. And, and so be thankful. If you're living today and you've got center ice and you got every friggin' game at your fingertips here uh, now, and be th- be thankful you're in an era where that's possible because it wasn't, you know, 30 years ago, uh, and uh, you know it just makes it it's certainly in our business now with uh, sports betting and handicapping. I mean, I'm telling you what to be able to keep tabs on every game. It sure makes our lives a lot easier. Yeah, uh, that's for I, sure. I There's couldn't no imagine question. trying to handicap no. hockey in in the 80s or 90s. Like, I mean, you know, with the amount of of games that we watch. <laughs> you know, just as a red, and we're not even talking about the live betting or the bet cast or any of that, just, just what we watch to get our information and, and, and to feel comfortable with how we bet. I mean, there's, there was no, there was no way to do that, you know, 25, 30, you know, 35 years ago. And that's, maybe that's the reason why hockey betting has now become such a big deal now. If nobody was doing it then because you could barely, you know, watch two or three games a week, let alone get a rhythm and feel of how the teams are playing, how the coaches are doing, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, right. it's fascinating. Yep. No online sports books, none of that. None of that shit was around back then. None of that. No, because casinos didn't have sports betting back then. None. Uh, only, maybe Las Vegas did. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. And if you wanted a box score, because the way we go about it, we need to look at box scores. we got to see how the game transpired. Even if we watch it, I like to see the box score. I want to see who had shots on goal, who had a good plus minus, or how many touchdowns, how many receiving yards did that receiver had, how many, the quarterback, what was his TDINT ratio? I want to be able to know all of that stuff. Back in those days, 80s, 90s, you want the box score, you uh, go to your mailbox, you re- get the sports section of your newspaper. That's how you'll find the box score. That's about it. That's, and, uh, that's how you found I, don't it. About, yeah. I don't know about how it was in Canada, but it, it, here in the States, and I grew up in Chicago, you got the Sun-Times box score. That thing had virtually no information other than who scored, who had the assist, and how many shots are going on in the game. You couldn't get any. Advanced statistics was beyond uh, a, a thought, you know, even going into the you know turn of the century, you know now so high danger chances, expected goals. No, nope, you're not going to get any of that. No, nope, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. any of that stuff that now everyone's got to throw out the advanced metrics, and yeah, it's just incredible how much it's uh, changed uh, between now and then. So you know the TSN era for you rolled on, and you were there still when TSN lost the cable rights to the NHL to CTV Sportsnet. CTV owned Sportsnet at that time, late 90s. So you transitioned, I believe, more into a regional play-by-play broadcaster with Montreal uh, for a few years there. But uh, then came the time, because, you know, without the national rights, I'm sure as a broadcaster, you're thinking, well, I'm doing regional games, but man, I'd love to do the games that are coast-to-coast and are most heavily viewed. So it almost came to a crossroads late 90s, early 2000s. You were still doing, you know, the World Junior and your other regular TSN play-by-play assignments. But then came a point where, well, hold on now. But they don't have the national rights anymore. And there was this radio station opening in Toronto. And you were st- kind of thinking to yourself, well, exper- experimenting maybe with a radio show gig uh, in Toronto. And that's when you made that decision. I believe 2001, Leap TSN, try out this uh, radio station opportunity, host a morning show with Team 1050 which was uh, 1050 Chum, which was an oldie station in Toronto, became a sports station. But the risk of starting up that station was trying to take on the big kahuna that is Fan 590, you know, at the time. And that was their big uh, stumbling block in the at the end of the day was them trying to take on this uh, giant in terms of Toronto sports radio station. And they attempted it with you being on there as a morning show host. Unfortunately, it didn't go well. And it's not because you and, I think Mike Richards and some of the other people that were on that station didn't try or didn't put on a good show. It's just that, you know, the ratings, it's a ratings business. And, and unfortunately, you know, it did not uh, match up with fan 590. So you, you took a chance there, Paul, a big chance. You left TSN, you tried this radio thing a year later. It doesn't wait. And I think the radio station stopped uh, with their sports format. So that ended quickly and then it just so happens that that's 2002. TSN's got the national rights to hockey back again uh, just at that time. And there you are. You had left TSN a year previous, and now you're out of this radio thing now, which didn't work out well. And here's TSN getting the television rights to hockey back, the cable rights, which, of course, CBC still had the final every year. But TSN had the cable rights to uh, hockey back. And that's when they made the decision because you weren't there anymore. Uh, that's when Gord Miller and Pierre Maguire ended up getting teamed together as the new uh, lead team for uh, TSN. So 
talk about all that. Any reg- any regrets? Anything you could have did? It's what it could have, should have, didn't because it's it's too late now. You'll drive yourself crazy thinking about what I could have done, what I should have done. Um, but you know, there you are. You left a great thing at TSN. Uh, took took a shot with something in radio, and it didn't work. They get the rights back. Did you feel too when the radio thing ended? I'll ask you that I I should have gone back or I wanted to go back and to TSN and ask, could I get my position back or get into the network again? Or were you just, wait a minute, I moved on. I tried this new thing. I don't really want to go back and ask them to go back. Uh, what, how, well, just I explain that whole period. I certainly would have gone back, uh, for, you know, for the, uh, and I would, uh, highly recommend against following the, the Paul Romanuk school of career management, uh, in that case. But if, you know, again, you can't live life in reverse at the time. Uh, I was ready for a change. I'd been at TSN for a while. I traveled a lot. I was probably on the road 150, 170 days a year. I did all their international hockey. Uh, I did uh, NHL regional hockey. The regional hockey I did was in Montreal. Uh, I did. You know, I was away a lot. So I was ready for a change. Always loved radio. And uh, like many people who are incentivized to change, uh, I was offered significantly more money than I was making at TSN to go and host this morning show on what was going to be uh, not just a regional, but a national radio sports radio network. They were going to try doing that in Canada. Uh, it failed spectacularly for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, the least of which it was th- the whole enterprise in hindsight was managed horribly uh, by the people uh, at Chum who were now they're all long gone out of the business. Uh, they, you know, they sold it off and, and changed ownership and so on. But so that fell apart after about 18 months. And it was your classic, I don't know if if anybody's ever worked in radio, it was your classic radio firing where they bring everybody into a room. We thought we were all going in. Hey, we're going to find out who the new program director is and ratings start in September. And it was like, nope, you're all fired. Going back to oldies. So, man, we're gone. And uh, And radio is a cruel business. You think TV is cruel. Radio could be just as much, if not more. Horrible. Just yeah. absolutely to treat to treat people like that. I ended up doing all right uh, because I, I had a contract that had to be honored and so on. Uh, but, you know, a lot of a lot of young people, first job people who were, you know, broadcast sportscasters or reporters. Um, you know, I knew I knew of one young guy where based on what they told him, no, we're going to stick with this format. We want it to work, yada, yada. Uh, and based on that, uh, he and his young wife had bought a house. Uh, and here a couple of months later, kicked out onto the street, you know, you're fired, you're gone. So there's that whole aspect of, of the radio business that really, you know, I came face to face with at that time. And it was tough, uh, in terms of regretting, you know, I would have liked to have gone back to TSN, but at that time, the way things worked, TSN was very much, you leave, you don't come back, you know, we don't want you to come back. And so that door was closed. Yeah. Now, when one, it's a cliche, but when one door closes, you want it back, but they weren't having you back, basically. Well, yeah, and well, and why would they, right? I like, I, I left, yeah. I left, and they had a guy who was champing at the bit to do play by play. You know, Gord Miller. Uh, Gord was a host at the time, uh, and he was sort of my backup play by play guy, and he wanted to be the number one play by play guy. Of course, who could blame him? And now this was going to be his opportunity. They weren't going to bring me back. They weren't going to bring Jim Houston back. They weren't going to bring anybody back. Gord was right there. Yeah. Uh, and, and Gord got the gig. And of course uh, it, it turns out that that was a spectacularly correct decision. Look at the career that he's had. He's still uh, going strong. Same exactly. network. Hasn't exactly. moved. Yep. Uh, so, you know, but what it did do uh, Ian and, and where I don't regret it a bit is at that time of my life, I needed a change. I made a change. It was uh, financially beneficial to me. It got me off the road for a while. And then what it really did is a few years down the road, uh, my wife was an executive with Coca-Cola and she was offered a position in London in the UK. And it had always been a dream of ours to live in London. Uh, We just love the city and we had friends there and so on. So that had I still been at TSN doing NHL hockey and that opportunity had have come up, we never would have explored it. However, at the time I was freelancing, I was doing work on Leafs TV. I was the radio voice of the Toronto Raptors. I was doing a, a bunch of things, but the opportunity to go and live in London uh, and, you know, and 
for my wife to be able to further her career, the, the opportunity that they offered her to go to work for a major global corporation in one of the biggest markets in the world and live in this city. Uh, and we went over there and ended up staying for almost 10 years. I would not trade that experience for anything. It, 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 was, the, wow. it was the most wonderful 10 years and it was just fantastic, a fantastic life experience. Uh, so weighing that off against, again, not that everybody makes their own decisions, but if I'm in 2020 hindsight, if I'm looking back and going, would I rather have been traveling around doing NHL play by play for those 10 years, like I'd done for the previous, whatever it was, 11 or 12, or would I rather have been living in London and experiencing all that I experienced, traveling all over Europe, doing work for the International Ice Hockey Federation, getting to do and see all these things? It's not even close in terms of a decision that I would make. Now, that's for me. Other people might make a different one, but I'm very comfortable with the decision that I made because I think it it opened up a, just an amazing life experience. To live in Europe, London, England, which nobody has ever said a bad word about taking a trip to London, England that I've talked to, uh, that's for sure, uh, in terms of their enjoyment of being over there. So if so, b- the, now the ultimate question is, if you're still at TSN 2001, 2002 and beyond, and this opportunity for you, Mrs. Romanuk comes along here uh, for London, England, would you still have moved? Over well, there? no, that, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. We, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, yeah. again, all things being equal, I would I would have been, well, you know, I'm. I'm the main NHL guy at TSN and they've got the the rights and well, I can't, you know, I can't possibly, I can't possibly leave that. And we probably wouldn't even have looked at it seriously, but because I didn't have a job like that, uh, it was like, yeah, you know what, this could be really, really great. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what happened. Well, here's the thing about the London experience, because that's the next part of your journey before your eventual return to Canada when Hockey Night in Canada uh, came a-calling, uh, Keith Pelly and Scott Moore and company, and we'll get to that uh, in a bit. But you go to London, and you, you, obviously you're excited to be there, the lifestyle and everything I've heard about European living. is It's a phenomenal uh, place to visit and even live uh, and start a life there. And you did that for a decade, essentially, over there. But from a broadcasting standpoint, you know, you ba- you basically were a hockey play-by-play guy, maybe a little bit of Raptors because you did basketball, as you said, for a year. But over in England, it's a soccer country slash European football. It's badminton. It's cricket. It's rugby. Uh, it's tennis. You know, it's all these other sports. And I'm sure you feel like you're trying to look for probably some broadcasting work, I'd assume, or something uh, in London. You're probably feeling like I should walk up and down the streets of London and hold up a sign, hockey anybody, hockey anybody. Uh, and see maybe if someone's going to come and, de- uh, and offer you a deal at that point. But how difficult was it trying to find work for yourself once you were living over there in London? Well, it, it was it was difficult in that there was no way I was going to find the same kind of work that I had in Canada. I mean, in Canada, I was a network level broadcaster doing NHL hockey, doing some of the biggest events on Canadian TV. Uh, that wasn't going to happen in the UK for a a couple of reasons. One, I had no credibility, no exposure. Nobody knew anything, nor should they, about what I had done in Canada. And it wouldn't hold much currency anyways. Uh, It would be liken that to somebody moving to Canada from the UK and saying, hey, I was the biggest rugby broadcaster in the UK. And they go, oh, that's great. Uh, You know, we do hockey, basketball, baseball, and football over here. Uh, So thanks for coming out. So I I, I wasn't, you know, naive enough to think that I was going to get the a chair on Sky Sports calling play-by-play for uh, for football, soccer. Um, however, you know, because London is such a big market, I was able to find some work. I did a lot of work for Eurosport, uh, which is a big sports channel in uh, in goes across Western Europe. And uh, I did play-by-play for softball, baseball, lacrosse, some basketball. Uh, I did the uh, all the men's and women's hockey in the Vancouver Olympics for Eurosport. So there was a lot of work for them, not on, you know, the A properties, the A properties over there are soccer. Uh, they did the tennis majors. They did the uh, Sport Alpine and Sky skiing. Sports, I believe, something like that. Yeah. Their big networks. Yeah. Yeah. B, uh, yeah. Sky Sports, Eurosport and uh, and BT Sports. So I I did get work and I got a lot of work for the International Ice Hockey Federation doing web content for them. 
Uh, and then I also, for Canadian uh, networks, I did the Spengler Cup every year for Sportsnet and then later TSN. Uh, I did a did the Olympics uh, for CBC as well as for CTV the year they had it. So, I mean, I was busy enough, but yeah, it was you know, you were looking, you were, you were out there scratching and looking around for freelance work, like, you know, you and a million other broadcasters, right? It's, uh, you, you just, you know how it works. You call people, you go have lunch with people and you try to find somewhere that's going to be a fit. But I, I knew going over, it wasn't going to be the same as, as Canada. A great clue was the sport that I was an expert in and, uh, had, you know, loved all my life calling play by play for was referred to as ice hockey. <laughs> You yeah, knew right now to clarify it. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it ranked in the sporting, uh, in the sporting consciousness. It wasn't even called ho- hockey over there is field hockey. Yeah. That's, a, that's another point. Yeah. You're right. Field hockey is bigger in uh, Britain and in uh, England and uh, ice hockey, obviously, but that that's cool. And I loved it. And I, I remember in the two thousands, like I turned on a Spangler cup game. Holy shit. Paul Romanuk. Oh my gosh. I've missed this guy. Where's he been? And, and there he was Christmas time calling Spangler cup in, Look, this is a big deal, Spengler Cup in that area, especially Switzerland and Davos in particular. And that arena, talk that arena, your Spengler Cup experience. I mean, just a fun tournament, and you know, a club tournament. And Canada always sent a team, but it would be European club teams that would be in that uh, tournament as well. But that arena always looked like a, the inside of a church, almost. You know, with just the architecture uh, and the way it was uh, built. Uh, and it's uh, it was a legendary tournament. You did this tournament with Doug Honiger for many, many years, uh, of course, who's been living over there. And just to have that experience, you know, to call the Spangler Cup, which, again, like I say, in that area it was a big deal, that tournament every single year. Uh, the Spangler Cup must have been a, a fun thing to have on the resume. Yeah, it's the oldest invitational uh, club team hockey tournament in the world. It is a it's a huge, huge deal in Switzerland. And uh, I had seen it during the years when I was going over to Europe doing the World Junior Championship. It was always on Eurosport. Uh, And it was like, wow, this looks like a really cool tournament and the crowds and the setting. Uh, Davos is a little slightly bigger than a village, maybe a small town in the Swiss Alps. Uh, and, and it's just, it's like living on a postcard for the two weeks that you're there. There's a, there's a mountain range on either side of the town. It's a road that runs in between the mountains and that's where the town is built. There's this beautiful rink, uh, that's big, you know, pillars and, and open, uh, open ceiling, a pillar and beam construction. So you see the wood and it, it does looks very church like inside. It's the most gorgeous hockey arena I've ever been in. Uh, there's a huge football pitch outside of the rink that they flood in the winter time, and people skate on it, uh, speed skaters as well as hockey games, and it, it was just fantastic. So I saw this on TV the years when I was over doing the World Junior, and I always thought, wow, I wonder why you know that doesn't get picked up. It would be a great TV thing in in Canada. So years later, when the opportunity presented itself. Um, I was able to get the the Canadian broadcast rights with a couple of partners and we approached Sportsnet and we were able to get it on the air there. And uh, it was there for several years and then it switched over to TSN where it still is. But uh, yeah, it, guys, if you're, you know, if you're a hockey head, uh, put this on your bucket list because to, to go there and uh, spend a couple of weeks over Christmas, uh, the tournament starts on boxing day and it ends. Uh, the, the gold medal game is at noon on new year's Eve day. Uh, so you go there and it's a mixture of skiing, uh, great uh, eating and drinking and uh, you know, hiking and walking if you want, but uh, two hockey games a day and in a beautiful arena, it's a just an amazing experience. Highly recommend it. There you go. Winter, a ski resort destination right there. Uh, recommended by Paul Romanuk. If you want one and you're going to have a damn good time, go to Davos for the uh, Spangler Cup uh, around uh, Christmas time. Kevin, talk about how you played. Obviously, you know, you played in Europe for many, many years. Uh, like I say, Kevin and among many others that we've had on this show, we've had countless current and former players on this show. Nobody has said a bad word. Nobody about playing in Europe. Doesn't matter if it's Switzerland, Germany, Italy. UK even where the EIHL is uh, going right now. You've got guys that play for, you know, uh, Belfast and some of these EIHL teams too, in the elite league in the uh, UK, but Kevin, same thing with you, right? Your European experiences, you enjoyed them at the end of the day. Yeah. And I was in the same kind of experience where I just got, I just got pushed over there in uh, an NHL lockout year. 
And if the walkout didn't come up, I probably would have never gone. So it was something where uh, just kind of got pushed for for a certain reason. But once I got over there, it's uh, yeah, days days I never take back. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade. Uh, very happy with experiences, everything I saw. Um, and then I was just going to mention that uh, Paul, I know I know my dad appreciated your work because when I first started playing in the minors in uh, in Texas, he they, they stream the games and I my mean, dad would watch them like the live stream and they have like a broadcaster on there, play by play. And my dad was always complaining. Cause he'd be like, after the games, he'd be like, I can't, I can't listen to this play by play guy. Like every time you make a save, the guy's like, Oh, and the goalie takes one in the gut. So he's like, I can't, you know, after watching, uh, watching you and, you know, in the leaf games and the world juniors, he's like, I can't, can't listen to these guys uh, down, down here in Texas. But you know, hockey, at that time, hockey was just getting going, kind of growing like the early two thousands, right. you know, um definitely the game has, has grown since then but i know i know he appreciated your work for sure oh well, th- thanks to your dad yeah yeah kevin I'm, I'm just i'm just scrolling through your career here in front of me and i can see that you did play over in europe uh did you ever get a sniff at the did they ever talk to you while playing in the spangler because of course they use guys over there and i can see you were in you were in uh it looks like you were in france and as well as in germany for a number of years did that opportunity ever come up was i know it was tougher for you guys than the guys in the swiss league yeah not, not for me but uh one, one of my good buddies uh michael lawrence was part of the, the coaching staff with canada uh the one year and he was coaching i think uh jeff glass and uh, zach Vicali, who who won a gold medal there and that was a year i was trying to uh because we usually got like a break a break there at christmas yeah. I was trying to jet over for the finals just for like a day or two. I wasn't able to get over there. Uh, but he talks about Davos. He's he's in Lugano now coaching. I've spent quite a bit of time down there hanging out. And just, yeah, the area down there, down there is beautiful. It never, never gets old uh, making a trip down there. Yeah. No, I, I mean, Kevin would be – you could do a whole show on this. But uh, I, I've always said when people – you know, I lived in Europe to to work, and it was for a different reason. But I always look at a guy like you who spent a bunch of time over in Europe, and uh, I always go, man, smart cookie. Like, would you would you rather be in uh, – I, I guess you have your NHL dreams, but if the choice is between uh, – cruising around in the East coast league or being a bubble guy in the American league. And you can go over and have the experience of living in Germany or Switzerland or France. Uh, I mean, I, I know what I do and I know what you did. It, it's just, it's just such a great life experience, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Like it's a, it's a tough decision when you're, you're that East coast guy, kind of bubble AHL guy. Cause you, you, you believe in yourself that you can, you can make it and work your way up to the NHL. And there are guys that do it, but uh, obviously if, if you're in that spot, you know, the chances are low. Um, and, and it's a matter of, of your decision. I think a lot of guys eventually do go because the quality of life is better. Uh, you're, you're making more money for the same, basically the same level of hockey, what you're playing. Um, but just, yeah, your, your experiences, it's, it's, it's a way better option. Uh, so it's a tough decision for guys that when they go and when they kind of give up that, that dream. Cause essentially when you, when you make that jump, you kind of are saying, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to make the NHL. You're kind of leaving that the the eyeballs of uh, you know all the scouts uh, on the, in the NHL organizations. Uh, but yeah, I, I almost wish I did it earlier. You know, um, I, I played two years in, in Paris, France too. Like that was, you know, like living in Paris was, was some of the best times of my life. No um, kidding. Yeah, yeah. Like that kind of relates to London. I had a chance to visit London. I can only imagine, uh, you know, being there and living there. Uh, but just uh, yeah, the, the architecture is just just so beautiful, and and you're just experiencing something something different every day. Um, so for, for those guys who are, are East Coast Hockey League guys, like for sure, I think make make the jump sooner sooner than later is kind of my uh, my recommendation. Yeah, there we go. Ian, Kevin and I are kindred spirits. We both we both wanted that uh, wanted that European experience. It was good. No, oh, it yeah. was good, and I've heard nothing but great things about it. It's going to make me want to get on the. Uh, 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 travel websites and uh, start booking some trips o- over there to Europe. I think it's uh, long overdue for yours truly. I've never been to Europe at all, and I've had, oh, I feel like I got, I've got to. Yeah, I've got to. And you know, I've been to Las Vegas ten times for obvious <laughs> reasons, but I've never been to Europe. And I think we got to fix that. <laughs> got to fix that shit uh, and get that done. Uh, I agree with that. So, Paul, at that time, so you're, things are going well. You lo- you're loving your Europe life. You're loving London. Uh, you know, you're getting enough work to get you keep you going you know, with freelance work and, of course, doing the Spangler Cup every year. You're thinking, boy, 
you and your wife, ah, we're really loving life here. We could be here for a while, maybe the rest of our lives. And then, of course, the big giant known as Roger Sportsnet comes a calling that we just got the Hockey Night in Canada uh, rights um, for the NHL. And this was, of course, you know, t- uh, 2013, 14-ish, uh, right around then. A- and they came to you with a proposal to be uh, not just one of their play-by-play broadcasters for Hockey Night in Canada, which, of course, remember, when Paul was doing play-by-play before, it was TSN. Uh, this was the big cahoon. This was the big. And you talked about it earlier in our interview. Hockey Night in Canada is the kingpin uh, when it comes to anybody wanting to be a broadcaster. And you're at the point where they come to you to be a, one of their guys, but not only got uh, play-by-play guys, you ended up being their number two guy. Okay? You got to do a conference final, you know, every year that you were there uh, with Roger Sportsnet on Hockey Night in Canada. Behind, of course, Jim Houston again for the second time uh, in his, in your uh, career. TSN now here, but still, to be number two to get a conference final, to be able to do Saturday nights and primarily Leaf games, primarily, you know, well, Jim would have done that, but primarily you'll do a Saturday night game. You'll do a Montreal game, you'll do, but you'll do Saturday night hockey, coast to coast. You'll do a ton of regular season games. This is hockey night in Canada. You're going to do a ton of playoff games involving Canadian teams as long as there's more than one you know you in the playoffs you were going to do some Canadian teams in the playoffs a conference final which of course back when you were on TSN you know you did some playoffs for them and some great games I think you did a crazy overtime with Pittsburgh Washington or Philly or one of those teams during your career with TSN it was a crazy game the but five back in those days, I think so I think yeah, that's okay. I think Paul and we'll, get, <laughs> and we'll get into some of Paul's great games because there's that one from TSN stands out and there's one from his time with Hockey Night in Canada that stands out as well and we'll play a clip of it in just a moment but you know Going to Roger Sportsnet, going to Hockey Night in Canada, it was almost at the point where as much as you're loving life in London, England, how do you say no to this? The number two guy, conference, finals, Saturday nights, coast to coast, this premier, uh, you know, Hockey Night in Canada is the thing uh, in Canada. It was going to take something monumental for Paul Romanuk and his wife to move back to Canada. And man, you got that monumental opportunity, didn't you? Well, it's a, yeah, to answer the question, how do you say no to that? You don't. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, you know, to have a chair on Hockey Night in Canada, I, I think every young guy calling hockey now or a young woman calling hockey now, uh, that's, that's where you want to be. That is, uh, again, to draw the analogy to the United States, that's, that's like doing Monday Night Football. Right. That's that's the big iconic show. So if you can get a chair on that show, you're going to take it. And uh you know, so we did and uh, we came back and I was uh, I would like to have been there longer, uh, but I was able to sort of live out a bit of a boyhood dream. And I was there for four years uh, before that ended. Uh, but it was you know, it was absolutely tremendous. It was uh, it was great to do. And I, I you know remember very clearly sitting in the booth. The first Saturday night game that I did was in Vancouver. I want to say it was a Vancouver Canucks and the Calgary Flames. And I just remember sitting there. I usually get up to the booth quite a bit before the game starts. I'll be up there maybe two hours before the game starts and you sort of set up your office and, and uh, you know, test everything out and get ready for the game. And it's pretty quiet up there at that time. It's, you know, long before the teams are out for warmups. I remember just sort of sitting up there in a relatively quiet arena and just having one of those moments of reflection that people often do in times like that. I'm sure Kevin had it before he stepped out onto the ice, uh, you know, for his first big game, just sort of that, wow, I'm going to do this. I can't believe it. You, you know, wherever you go in your head at that moment. And uh, that's where I was. So I, it, it was, it was tremendous to be able to, uh, to live that out. It was, it, you know, I wouldn't trade it. It was, and of course we would come back and, and uh, from that standpoint, I'm glad we did. Yeah. And like I say, um, it was too short though. It was absolutely too short because it felt like it was, what, four or five years when it was all said and done that you were there, and it felt like it should have been a lot longer. But, you know, it's a tough business, and they spent $5.2 billion uh, on this NHL contract deal, and they just weren't getting the revenues back enough. And they paid, you know, they paid everyone well from what I've read, you know, that was that were hired, the studio people, Kiprios. And, they, of course, George Strombolopoulos started off as the uh, host of the uh, Hockey Night in Canada pregame show, and then ended up being Ron again. Uh, after that but they paid everybody well and they were expecting big revenues and then there were multiple factors 
that they paid this exorbitant amount of money for this huge studio that they built that they're still using, I think, today. Uh, and it added up and the revenues coming back just didn't uh, add up to what they spent for this incredible contract that they're and they're still, you know, bleeding money, hemorrhaging money to these days. There's some damn good people that had to fall on the sword because of this, including you and Randorf and Kiprios initially, you know, and there's just so many people, Doug McLean. I mean, go, the list goes on and on. Um, and it's all financial. I, I'm sure it was not at all performance related. It was just that it's, it's all business and it's all money at the end of the day. And they had to cut back in a big way and they're still having to cut back. Uh, I would think They're, they can't even send a third or fourth crew, you know, to some of these playoff games. I mean, you're seeing basically Chris Cuthbert, who's there now with Craig Simpson. And you've got, of course, the the second crew, too, with Harner Ryan Singh with Louis DeBrusque, you know, on their other crew. And they are just so tight. They're tightening the belt so much, Roger Sportsnet, because of all the money that's been drained from this deal that they can't have a third crew consistently for the Stanley Cup. They'll drop Bartlett and Gary Galley in there every now and then for a couple of games here. And I, it was weird. The Dallas series against Vegas, I see Gary Galley and John Bartlett for one game, two games. Where are they for the third and the fourth game? Oh, they're using the ESPN feed with McDonough and Ferraro. For the, for, I mean, it's just that shows you, Paul, how tough of a time this has become for them with this contract just because they spent so much on it. They're not getting the revenues back for it. Yeah, there's, I mean, present company uh, excluded, but uh, there's been uh, some some great, great people uh, who I stand proudly with who, uh, you know, for financial reasons, uh, got going to run out of town. Uh, you know, Dave Randorf, great guy, Dave, great podcast. Randorf, excellent play-by-play guy. Uh, you know, you go back to uh, uh, Glenn Healy, who was a between-the-bench guy yep. uh, in the first couple of years. Uh and that's not even to mention the behind the scenes people. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, the guy who was the lead hockey director for TNT was recruited to do it for TNT. I worked with him for many years for my money. Um, there is no hockey director working right now who is better than he is. There may be some who are as good. There are none I've worked with or seen who are better. The guy's name is Paul Hemming. He's directing the Stanley cup final for TNT. You want to know why their broadcast kicks ass? It's yeah. phenomenal, by the way. It's absolutely yeah. outstanding. Yep. And he was at Rogers at the start of it all. And for whatever reason, uh, they decided that, uh, you know, he wasn't going to be at Rogers. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, TNT knew better. And they've got him. He's their lead director for the Stanley Cup Finals. So there's some very, very talented behind the scenes people as well. I know the on air people. That's what you see, of course, but some great behind the scenes people uh, took it as well. So it's uh, I'm, I'm really happy for a guy like Paul. And I just wanted to shout out Paul, uh, who's going to direct the Stanley Cup final for TNT. And he'll do a, an amazing job. He's a great director. Yeah. And TNT is I think TNT is the gold standard of hockey programming and hockey broadcasting in North America right now. And I think there was a time I say I would never say, thought I'd see the day where a U.S. produced for a U.S. network would be the best that there is to offer right now with NHL uh, coverage in North America. But I find that. I think TNT top to bottom. That studio program, there's a reason they're emulating what they've done so well with the NBA, with Kenny and Charles and Shaq and Ernie Johnson. It's because it works. They've got an incredible dynamic, and they're developing that right now with Liam McHugh and Paul Bissonnette, who's a entertaining funny character and they've got of course Anson Carter who had a nice career in the NHL for a very long time and they dropped Wayne Gretzky in for the conference finals one of the, you know, the best of all time uh Henrik Lundqvist has been great on television with TNT since retiring I mean it's an all-star crew well they've got. it's a it's a credit to TNT and uh, uh it's amazing when you look at what they've been able to accomplish with hockey broadcasting in two years in just two years, and and hockey, uh, it is you know as Alex would uh, you know would would probably back me up. Don't on. take it for granted, Alex. What you're watching on TNT every <laughs> but it's, day. It's, right. it, it is hardly it is hardly the number one sports property for television in the United States. I mean, even for T hockey's, I'm not saying it's an afterthought, but I mean TNT is all about the NBA. Yeah. You know that, that, that's what they're about. Uh, sports television in the United States is it's about the NFL. Uh, so you have hockey, which is in, you know, in many ways, a second tier broadcast sport in the U S <clears throat> and I don't mean that as disparagingly, it's, it's just a fact in terms of ratings. <clears throat> and you look at the resources TNT put into it and how good it is in two years. 
and then you look around and see what else is out there. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and if the if the league, we talk about this all the time. We talk about TV coverage and stuff quite often on this program. And one of the things we've always said is that you know if the league would try to just expand more, put games, you know, like I said on. Uh, you know, satellite uh, antenna and, and over-the-air TV here in the States and just give more exposure, even if it's not the greatest deal in the world. You, see, you know, we have college uh, conferences signing off with, you know, basically, you know, networks that are just two steps above, uh, you know, regional programming or, or, or public access, and they're getting WNBA deals and Pac-12 deals. It's like the NHL could easily sign up with a, a, a mid-tier network and have more access, you know, along with what they – they were doing with TNT and ESPN, and that would give them a chance to try to raise the salary cap, raise revenue, do different things that the NBA have been able to do with just a couple of networks. So the NFL have been able to do with just a couple of networks. Yep, absolutely. Just phenomenal coverage. Uh, TNT's done a, a great job. Alex, you were going to mention, I think, uh, and now we can get to it, Paul's greatest games, if you will, or Paul's greatest hits, at least in the NHL, because there were a couple. That game in the '90s, uh, that uh, you 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 were spot on about that five overtime game, right? Alex it was Washington, mm-hmm. right? It was Washington. No, it was Philly, Pittsburgh, Philly, five overtimes in uh, 2000. I want to say, yeah. yeah, was it that one, Paul? I know there was a crazy overtime game in the TSN days, late '90s. It was a crazy. There were, game. there were a couple of them. The one I remember, it was uh, Pittsburgh, Washington, and I want to say it was quadruple overtime. I'm just doing this off the top of my head in Washington at the old Cap Center. Uh, with Greener, yeah, with yep. Greener, and uh, the it was a really weird game. Mario Lemieux had been kicked out earlier in the game. Uh, they went into overtime, uh, and I remember we had shots of like after the second overtime period. Uh, I think the Penguins got a pizza delivery to the arena because the guys needed fuel, and we had shots of the, like the pizza guys walking in the back door with armloads of pizzas and feeding them to the players in the room. And I want to say the winning goal was scored by, I want to say it was Peter Nedved for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Mark Tenorti blocked the first attempt. Puck came back. Uh, Nedved shot, scored. Uh, and he scored on, I believe, Olaf Kolzig was the Washington goalie. That's my memory of it. Yeah, yeah. May, May 24th and 25th of 1996. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was, I knew that. I knew it was Pittsburgh. I, uh, it was involved, and it was TSN. And by the way, they just—that was like the first season or second season. They finally, and it was all the networks were getting into it. The score bug at the corner of the screen. We could always see how much time's left in the period wow. and the score at all times. Yeah. Like that was just starting, you know, <laughs> right in the mid '90s. Fox, yeah. Fox was one of the first networks to do it, but TSN wasn't far behind. Uh, in terms of putting the score on the screen at all times. And now well, you can't you guys imagine didn't the have daylight. The light. Don't have yeah, you guys didn't yeah. have the Fox track light like we had in the States. So oh, <laughs> that's probably no blue puck. No. <laughs> no, I couldn't believe they did that still. And I feel bad. I mean, there's some great people that did play-by-play for Fox Hockey in the late oh. 90s. Kenny Albert, who's the lead voice now on TNT, and Doc Emmerich, who I adore his play-by-play, and so many great play-by-play men. And they had to call that sport, unfortunately, <laughs> with that disgrace of a – the, the fox tracks or the the red the red shoom the red arrow when it was a slap shot or something and the puck always you know glowing with a blue this dot on it i mean it was just awful i feel bad for them because i'm sure deep down inside they're what the hell is this shit and, and we're on we're trying to call this right now and we're calling this hockey and you know i look i know especially back then look there's no hd there's no 4k i get it harder to see the puck for the viewer i totally get that but that's mickey mousing the sport and cartooning it up, and I hated it. Hated it completely, Paul. <laughs> they, I remember they also had uh, – oh, they were just trying something different, but they also had the uh, the Fox bots, which were yeah. like sort of animated robots mm-hmm. that would yeah. come on and high-five one another or whatever when there was a goal scored. Yeah, there, there was a lot of – I can remember a lot of gnashing of teeth uh, from Canadians in particular over over that, yeah. Yeah, but and TNT, you look at – actually, you compare Fox's presentation then to TNT now – uh, and it's just professional, and they treat it with great dignity, respect, uh, and that absolutely the way it should be. All right, uh, we will get into Stanley Cup final in just a few minutes I've, uh, because we're getting to the tail end of Paul's uh, long run as a great broadcaster. But I have to bring this up because to me it's the game that stands out from his Roger Sportsnet Hockey Night in Canada tenure uh, as play-by-play voice. You know, it's that incredible Austin Matthews debut game. It has to be. I mean, just the fact that you got to call that, Paul. Toronto Maple Leafs, Ottawa Senators, 
right? And it was the first game of Austin Matthews' career. He scores four goals uh, in his very first uh, NHL game. Uh, that, I think, to me, now you called some great playoff games, obviously, playoff series, uh, conference finals every year that you were with Hockey Night in Canada. But to me, in terms of one game that's just, wow, that was something special. You know, from a television standpoint in this country, your voice will be attached to Austin Matthews' Toronto Maple Leafs NHL debut in Ottawa when he scored four goals in his first NHL game. That is something you will have in your back pocket, Paul, for the rest of your life. And I think it's a great – it's got to be something that, wow, I was part of that. It's pretty cool. Here was the – Gets it in front of the net. Pollock trying to get untangled. Puck goes around. Matthews scores! I love it. The raspy but incredible goal to tone to Paul Romanuk on the uh, call there. Now, when he had two goals at this point, Paul, when he had scored two goals at this point, what were you thinking? Like, oh my gosh, is this going to be one of these nights where he might just absolutely pop off? Like, he had gotten two at that point. Did you think it would eventually lead to three and four? Uh, no, is the is the honest answer. Um, you know, going in when it's somebody's first NHL game, and in particular when it's somebody as high profile as as Austin Matthews, um, you're kind of prepared for the fact that he might score. He, he'd had a really good preseason. His reputation preceded him. He'd come off the the great year, uh, a boy playing amongst men with Zurich over in the Swiss League, which is a pretty competitive league. So you knew he was something special. And I wasn't surprised. I was expecting that he would probably score a goal. Uh, and the first goal was okay. Uh, you know, they were all down. Uh, I think I said, you know, uh, all in trying to get untangled. Uh, you know, they're all down around the front of the net. Puck comes out. He chops it home, so he gets the goal. Great. First NHL goal. Uh, but then that second one where he wins the puck in the neutral zone, undresses at that time one of the best defensemen in the league, still one of the best defensemen in the league this past season, Carlson along the wall, and then steps in and from the sharp angle finds the back of the net. That I think you heard Gary Galley, who was my colleague that night doing color commentary, just said, yep. wow. And at that point, you know, eyes, eyes were bulging a little bit. Did I expect that he'd score a hat trick? Uh, I didn't really have time to think about it, but did I expect that he would score four? No. Had I even had time to think about it, I wouldn't have said, yeah, he's going to get four. Uh, so it was a, it was quite a night. It was, uh, it was something to watch. And the quick release too, on that second goal that we just showed, if you're watching on YouTube, you would have just seen the clip of it. It was just that quick release. He stole the puck. He did the incredible job to get around Carlson. There's that quick release. The goalie's not expecting it, not ready for it. It was a perfectly placed shot. Just shows you the skill level he has. And uh, just an incredible, now he was at two goals, but he wasn't done here as we're going to about to see. Here's the hat trick goal coming up. Puck out in front. Matthew scores. A hat trick. Nothing else to say, you know, at that point. What a debut, a hat trick in the very first game. And look, he didn't even have any mustache. You know, we always think of the Austin Matthews stash these days. Didn't even have that. Just a clean uh, uh, baby face kid, essentially, at that point. He was playing his uh, first uh, game. And then, of course, he was not done yet. Uh, he had another one coming up. We'll just fast forward a little bit. Now, there he is, the voice of Gary Gowley, of course, who, uh, Paul was working with that night, but yeah, the parents were in the house for uh, Austin Matthews that night, and here is the uh, fourth goal, right at the end of the second period, gave the Leafs the lead. Now, I got to pause it there. What a luminescent night. Danny Gallivan from heaven and Doc Emmerich, if he hears that phrase, they'd be they'd be smiling right now. 
uh, because they would have loved uh, you using that term, uh, lumen, and that's what it was. It was a luminescent, spectacular night uh, for Austin Matthews. And to me, Paul, it's got to be one of the, you know, top three, top five highlights uh, of your career. Calling that game, it was something. No, it was, uh, and the the luminescent was after he'd scored the hat trick. <clears throat> I was uh, I was trying to think of because uh, usually you'll give sort of you know at the end of the game you'll have a moment to sum up the game and you know there's a final whistle and uh, it's uh, Leafs win by a score of five to three and they'll have a shot of the hero of the night and it was uh, you know a, a great night for uh, Austin Matthews uh, two goals and one assist and he leads the Leafs to the win so stuff so I was trying to think of something you know to to give it a little bit of uh, a little bit of an added sort of kick at the end because he clearly had an amazing for the ages game. And I was just going through words in my mind and I thought, well, he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, he just, he had a, an amazing night. He had a brilliant night. Brilliant, brilliant. What's brilliant. Ah, brilliant. Brilliant means really shiny, luminescent, luminescent's a good word. And I just, thought doc it. would think seriously, I'm, I'm convinced mm-hmm. of it. Doc Emmerich would think that way. How well, am I, what uh, word could I really use to really punctuate this? Yeah, yeah. So it was down there for the end of the because at the end of the game, I was going to say, you know, when they give the hero shot at the end, I would I would have probably said something like, and uh, and for the Leafs rookie Austin Matthews, a luminescent night. He scores a hat trick in his NHL debut, something like that. But then when he scored his fourth, uh, <laughs> I thought, well, I better use it now. So. Uh, is, you know what are you going to say when a when a kid has a night like that? It was it, it was a special thing to be a part of. And it's funny. I got a quick story about that night and that game in particular. So that was you know the, the you know season starting, and we talk about coverage and television coverage the difference in the in the U.S. and Canada. We still had center ice package for cable at the time, but mine wasn't cutting on. So while Austin Matthews is scoring those first couple of goals, and, and keep in mind I have money on the over, which thankfully did cash easily. But I'm screaming at people at Comcast to try and get my center ice package cut on. Meanwhile, my mom's texting me because she's watching the game and she's seeing Austin Matthews score these goals. She's in Chicago and I'm here in Minnesota. And so eventually when my cable, when the package finally cut on, it was right when Austin scored the fourth goal at toward the end of the second period. So I did get to catch that call and end up watching the rest of that game. But I missed the first three and it was all because of uh, damn cable. <laughs> we were doing the show still at that time the ice guys you know uh at that, yeah, that season i think mm-hmm. uh, 2016 i believe yeah. it was uh and yeah we were doing the show uh at that time and uh yeah i remember that night where we were all just in awe we're watching this incredible debut for austin matthews number 34 and poor alex can't see the damn thing or at least <laughs> half of it uh because of uh cable issues but uh uh, it was just an incredible game. And, yeah, Rich H. in our chat, I'll put this on the screen, this comment from Rich, who's one of our great friends. Uh, he's been on our BetCast. We're going to have another one tonight for Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Final. It is over. Canada, world champion. You're right, 1994, that crazy long shootout. I remember it. Bill Ranford uh, in net. Uh, T- uh, Bobby Mack, Bob McKenzie, the Bob father. Bobby Margarita now uh, in his afterlife, <laughs> which is – I've tried that, actually. It's good if you like uh, margarita in a can. I, I, I give it the thumbs up. Uh, but yeah, J- uh, Ranford jumping up and down after making the final save to win the shootout. Paul making that call. Rich H remembers it. And so do I. That's right up there too, right? Yeah, it was pretty special. Uh, the um, the thing, is, to put that in context, the, uh, in 1994, uh, Canada didn't have a great deal of success in, in the international hockey world. Um, you know, the, it, it was... They were they played well at the World Junior Championship. They never won at the uh, World Championship. You know they hadn't won it in 33 years at that point. And just a few months prior, uh, at the Olympics, Canada lost in a shootout to Sw- to uh, Sweden. That was the famous Peter Forsberg stamp game. Uh, so you know things were, were were not going along incredibly well for Canada at that level on the international stage. So it was a really, really big deal when they finally won that tournament uh, in 1994. And of course, they've gone on to play very well there uh, over over the last number of years. But that was their first one in 33 years. And it was uh, Luke Robitaille scored the winner in the shootout and Ranford made that big stop. And uh, and that was that. Uh, yeah. And just uh, well, I've never, I was only nine years old. But man, I was remember, I was watching the World Junior every year at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old. I remember those. Uh, and that uh, one, again, a little foggy in the memory bank, but I do remember it a little bit. Uh, and uh, great, great, um, great, great memories of uh, those Canadian World Junior uh, Championship uh, runs. Uh, so just 
I, I think I think we I don't think we left any stones unturned here. I think we pretty much you got, uh, them, all. You got them all. I think I'm pretty sure of that. I'm pretty sure of that, Paul. So you know we're gonna I'm gonna be brief personally with the analysis for Game Two of the Stanley Cup Final, which we're gonna do right now. We'll talk about it, uh, four of us here for uh, five ten minutes. Then we'll let Paul run because he's been. Uh, gracious with his time to be on with us this long. Uh, but we'll talk game two here, Stanley Cup final, uh, Florida, Vegas, Vegas right now, minus 140 home favorites in game two, five and a half the total uh, in this game. Of course, in game one, I did take Vegas in the first period, you know, fell short because the game was tied after the first period, but I did have the first period of full game over thinking, you know, with Florida off 10 days going into game one, be a little sloppy puck management would be a little bit of a problem for them. And I think we saw that a little bit more of a loose a game one feel to it. Um, so I expect as the series goes on, and I said this on Saturday, uh, that the series will tighten up. You know, it, it definitely will get lower scoring, and you'll see definitely both teams, you know, as the series goes on, and they get closer to that fourth win and, and a potential Stanley Cup, you'll see the series tighten up. These are two teams with very good defensive play throughout the playoffs, especially Vegas. One through six, I don't think there's any better with Petrangelo and Martinez, Cup winners. They are both of them. Theodore. Zach Whitecloud, Nick Haig, they're just so good on the blue line. Florida's gotten everything and more than that from their depth defensemen. We know Ekblad and Forsling and Montour are great, but what they've gotten from their depth defensemen has been outstanding. Bobrovsky's been playing great. Aiden Hill, man, we got to start giving him his props for what how he's played. That stick save with the goal stick uh, in game one, I don't think you're going to find many better yeah. saves than that. It was absolutely outstanding. All-out effort stop. Um, and uh, he was terrific, and he continues to play well. The way I'm going to approach this game is I like the first period over again. I think we've got a pattern here where Vegas, I think going back to the Dallas series, this is like six or seven games in a row for Vegas where they've gone over in the first period. You know, it's quite the streak now for Vegas games over one and a half in the first period. So I do like that here in this game. And I'm going to take a shot with Florida here tonight. Even though I like Vegas in the series, Florida is going to have a pretty strong response tonight. I don't mind the price, plus 120. So that's what I'm looking at here, Panthers and Golden Knights tonight. I like the first, the full game over a little bit, but I like the first period over even more because I could see it being another two goals or more in the first period. Then things tighten up and things will slow down just a bit. So first period over and Florida money line for me. Uh, Alex, by the way, Paul, uh, Alex uh, hung out with Aiden Hill's father when the when the, the, t the team was in town, Vegas, in Minnesota, which is where Alex lives for a game against the Wild. So uh, Alex knows uh, Aiden Hill's pops. So we're kind of rooting for him. And I know Alex now all a of a bit, sudden, yeah. yeah, more of an Aiden Hill fan now. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, I got to hang out with, with a few of the fathers from uh, – they were on that dad trip. They were in Nashville, and then they came to St. Paul, had a nice night out. And uh, a friend of mine bartends at the, the lobby bar in the St. Paul Hotel where they most of the visitors stay. So got to hang out with a few of them, and uh, Aiden Hill's dad stuck around, watched the whole game. We, you know, bought each other beers and stuff. And really regret not getting his number now because he's going to be a UFA. And man, would I love to see him in the West Side of Chicago, uh, it, it, whether they win the cup or not. But I'm sure Vegas will throw a bag at him. But you know, he's played uh, tremendous in this whole season, and you know, this is a guy who hadn't even really had much playoff time at any level in his career. Uh, you know, had always been shuffled back and forth between the A and the NHL, and now to, to be shining in this moment, that big stick save, that we're, we're going to be seeing that on highlights for years to come, especially uh, if Vegas wins. They're already talking about making that a statue. So uh, at least if you ask some of the fans uh, around town in, in Las Vegas. So it, it's huge to see and uh, yeah, you know, just playing well and, and getting hot at the right time. Yep, no doubt. So, Alex, what are you liking here uh, in game two? So I'm going with a few plays. I have the draw. At plus 325, which everybody, if you watch this and watch the, the series preview, I like that. I already bet uh, like three of the games will go to OT at plus 800. We came really close to it in game one, to be honest. I mean, it was, you know, tied 2-2. Two, That's two. a 2-2 two, two game in the third, exactly. Right, right. You know, yeah. Vegas gets the goal to make it 3-2, and then, you know, you just got a, a calamity of, of errors from, from Florida and the frustration and the, and the fatigue kind of boiled over. And that's kind of mostly what took them out. I think we see a, a more disciplined game. We'll see the chippiness early, but I think we see a more disciplined second half of this game, second and third periods. Things kind of tighten up and slow down, and that's what will take us uh, past regulation into the overtime. So I have that play as well. Also have a, a half unit on Florida to win game two and Vegas to win the series at plus 275. Now I had each of, uh, uh, of the teams to win game one and Vegas to win the series in pocket, I, I was going to get plus 400 at Florida one or plus 145 at Vegas one. Vegas one, so now I have this plus 20, 145 ticket alive. So now I'm going to try and 
add on to that, while well, also I because I like Florida to win game two. That was kind of the way I looked at, at things going in this series anyway. I was looking to try to back Florida in some kind of way. I think that's the best way to do it is you know get plus two two seventy five to get the win here and still look for Vegas to try to win this series. So those are the two plays I have, and uh, probably will be on the first period over as well. But that would be something I'll jump in and bet in game during the betcast which is tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you join. We might have Eddie Lack, by the way, on with us again during the uh, BetCast as well tonight. So uh, he's been jumping in uh, a few of our BetCasts. Uh, so join us for that Game 2 Stanley Cup Final BetCast tonight at 8 p.m. You just email me at bobano350 at gmail.com or DM me at, on Twitter at Bobano, and we'll send you the link for it if you want to join us for the BetCast. You know, we have a comment as well from Rich here. Aiden Hill seemed to be really overplaying the puck early in the game. It's what led to that ridiculous stick save i wonder if kevin saw that too well it's a good thing we have a goalie in the house right what did you think of that save there kevin yeah everyone's been, been pulling up those pictures from that the hopey save back when they won the cup so um that save was probably the turning point right there like that was that was massive um and i think yeah it, it was it was a closer game than than what the score kind of came out to so uh that could have gone you know a couple couple turning points and that was probably the biggest one in the game um I thought overall he was he was fine with his puck handling. Um, you know, one player here or there, but yeah, that was that was an absolutely massive save. Uh goal it was one, one at the time, timely save. They always talk about yeah. timely saves. That was one. Exactly mid-game there. Um I mean I thought I thought he was great. He really uh really and, and Bobrovsky was awesome too. I mean, they finally yeah. found a way to pass him. I think Vegas knows the importance of getting traffic in front of him. Um you know, Shots from the point with traffic. Take the goalie's eyes away. They did it. Two of those yeah. goals. White Cloud's goal yeah. and Theodore's goal. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I think they know the importance of that. I think Florida's going to make their adjustments, though. They they came out a bit – I'm not going to say too aggressive because you want to set the tone early in the series. But, um, yeah, like Alex said, that's you can't take that many penalties. And and that's they're going to clamp down on that. They know that. So they kind of showed early on that, hey, you know, they took their, their kind of shots after the whistles. Um, but now down one nothing, you can't, you got to play hockey. Uh, so I think that's really going to tighten up. That's why I like the under in this game. I think I am going to pull it to uh, under six. Under six, give me, uh, it's, it's minus 128 to play. I feel a little safer with, with under six rather than 5.5. But I think both goalies have, have shown that they're here to play. I think both teams are now going to cut, cut a little bit of that after the whistle stuff and, and take an extra penalty out. Um, and I think it's going to, yeah, slow down a little bit here and, uh, yeah, it's going to be another good game, but this is, this is a goaltending series here. This is, this is going to be fun to watch here, uh, these next couple of games. Yeah. No question. Any props you like props. I just, I just have my, uh, my series props. So I, I'm playing the under, um, and I do like the, I like the draw. I'm going to jump on the draw with Alex too. I just think this is going to be a tight game. So I'm going to stay away from props as far as uh, shots and goals. Um, I, I look for the goalies, the to take over hopefully the next couple of games here, which is going to kind of limit what the, what the players are doing on, on, on props. And and if there's less penalties, if they, if they take away those power play opportunities, that's cutting down some guys shot opportunities as well. So uh, other than those props I put in for the, the series, I'm staying away from them on the game today. There if I go. want to, if I want to put a couple, uh, a couple on uh, con Smythe trophy winner before the series starts, uh, who's, who's, uh, who's the, who's the early line. Oh, the favorite, well, the favorite was Bobrovsky there. Yeah, it'll be Bobrovsky um, or Kachuk. Bobrovsky and Kachuk. Kachuk, Kachuk yeah, there. depending on what book. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I I jumped on Bob, just because I felt like it could be one of those years where, I mean, usually ninety five percent of the time you have to be on the winning team. This is the one year I felt like, in a while, where if if Florida loses, you know, if Bobrovsky he kept up that level, he mm -hmm. he could actually win it, just because Vegas has been more across the board steady. They haven't really had one guy been way ahead of the rest of the team. Um, so that's the one one guy I put, put some coin on just because I thought even if they lose, he's a guy that could still win it. See, Do Paul, you, with, the, with the con Smythe, Paul, uh, regarding that, the Bobrovsky and Kachuk are the only two guys we all think can win it for Florida. For Vegas, it's a little more complicated. Jack Eichel could win it. Jonathan Marcheseau, I really think, yes. is dangerous to win it. Yes. He's on a tear right now, Paul. Jonathan Marcheseau has 14 points in the last nine games. He was left unprotected by the Florida Panthers in the expansion draft, which allowed Jonathan Marcheseau to get selected by Vegas. So you think he wants, as an axe to grind? Now, I know it's totally different management and coaching staff now with Florida compared to then, 
but he still got you know passed up by Florida. He said, "We'll let you. We'll we'll leave you unprotected, Jonathan Marsh, so so that Vegas can draft you." And the same with Riley Smith. So I think those two players in particular want to have big series here for the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. And Marsh is so with 14 points in the last nine games. He got one of their goals in game one. And he's like plus 650, plus 700. He's not the favorite on his own team or overall to win the Conn Smythe right now. So I think from a value standpoint, Paul Marsh is the look for me, especially if Vegas wins this series. All right, I'm taking notes. There you go. Good stuff. What's your thoughts, Paul, the series and game two tonight? Well, I think – I was sort of just crunching some numbers before I went into this and it, I, I've got more it's sort of a big picture thing. And it's, it's interesting when you look back, I, I think the, the general consensus is you have to have amazing goaltending to win the Stanley cup. Uh, and to me, I've always thought that the most important item in your toolbox to win a Stanley cup goaltending is important, but I think you can win the Stanley cup with good goaltending like really good, but it doesn't have to be amazing. I don't think you can win the Stanley Cup without a stud defenseman uh, who's going to play, you know, 25, 30 minutes a game, run your power play, and a modern type defenseman who can carry the puck out of danger. Because, I mean, I looked at Colorado last year. Darcy Kemper, I mean, good goalie, very good, but not far from the best goalie in the league. But Kale McCarr? Norris Trophy winner was playing over 27 minutes a night. Now, a couple before that, Tampa, right? You could make the argument Vasilevsky, probably the best goalie in the league. But then you looked at Hedman. You know, Hedman was playing 24, 26 minutes a night. Oh. Year before that, St. Louis. Bennington, again, good goalie, not the best goalie in the league. But Petrangelo was playing over 25 minutes a night, running the power play. And I just uh, I just think it's interesting. With that. Now, I realize I'm talking, one of the guys I'm talking to here is a goalie. So maybe he thinks goaltending ending absolutely has to be amazing to win the cup but you ever think about that like do you, do you think what would you rather if you're a gm would you rather have the best goalie in the league on your team for the playoffs or the best defenseman in the league yeah for me no i, I agree with that that trend uh every team has to have like that absolute stud defenseman um where you look at these two teams both those teams kind of have a couple of those guys, you could argue a couple of those guys, uh, Florida with, with Ekblad and Montour, who's emerged here this year. Um, and then you got, you got Theodore and, and Petra Angelo on Vegas. So they, they kind of are, are kind of doubled up and, and Colorado was kind of with the luxury of that last year was just that overall high, high end depth on, on defense. Um, and, and no, I, I agree with your, uh, your judgment on goaltending. Like, Overall, if you have a really good defensive uh, core there, like you can get away with just good, good goaltending. Um, but obviously, when you look down and you do have a guy playing like Babowski or Veseleski the last couple of years, like man, that's that's pretty nice to see too. For sure, for sure. Well, one yeah. thing I want to point out too about the goaltending as well, and it's important to point this out. Uh, I was with Gabe Morenci doing his show last night, and he said a good point. And I think he's actually right about this. You don't need necessarily the great goaltender, like the guy that's been, you know, great for years and the Carey Price and the Vasilevsky. You just need the hot goaltender. You know, you just need the goaltender that maybe comes out of nowhere with maybe mediocre numbers. And, you know, in, you know, maybe he's been inconsistent his whole career up and down. Maybe he was on a team that like Braden Hill, for instance, Arizona, bad defensive team, you know, weaker team in front of him. But now he's on a really good team and he's playing great. He's And all of a sudden he's playing well. You just need that goaltender to be at his best at the right time of year, this time of year, uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs. And we're seeing That's that. Sure. Heading, heading into the playoffs, if you put Aiden Hill and you know Bob up there, who's who's picking those two as your as your goaltender right. if you're doing a fantasy yeah. draft heading into the playoffs? Nobody. Yeah, right. Because of how yeah. inconsistent Bob was, too. Bob's ill late in the season. Bob was so inconsistent this year. Paul Maurice had confidence and faith in Alex Lyon to take his team into the playoffs, even though Bob was healthy again and ready to go. But Alex Lyon was in a zone there. Alex Lyon was playing out of his mind for that period of time. And there was, at that moment, there was that lack of trust in Bobrovsky because he had such a mediocre season. And then all of a sudden, here in the playoffs, he's doing what he's doing. It's just, it's absolutely spectacular to see it and stunning, quite frankly, to see it. Not that he couldn't because he was a Vesna Trophy winner. And as Alex has talked about Paul on our show before as a Blackhawks fan, hey, Anti Niemi won a Stanley Cup, so yep. anybody can win a Stanley <laughs> Cup. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think and it's we talk about getting hot at the right time with Aiden Hill. 
you know, Vegas was going through five different goalies because of injuries and different types of issues, and, and now he's the guy to step up at the right time. But Brodsky is stepping up because, except you know, Alex Lyon did as much as he could to get them into the postseason, but he wasn't going to be able to carry them all the way through. Spencer Knight's in witness protection right now, so you basically have Brodsky or nothing, and you got that's what they're rolling with, and he's playing arguably the best hockey of his entire career. Yeah. So, so who's so who's the Kale McCarr guys? So who's who's the Kale McCarr this year? I'll tell you who's playing like him in this series. It's Montour or in these playoffs kind of yeah. for uh, Florida. I mean, he's just been, he's been driving the offense. He's been rushing the puck up the ice. Uh, he's had that booming shot from the point. Uh, he's been, he's been spectacular. He's had, a, he's a lot of Kale McCarr in him with the way he's played here in the uh, playoffs. Uh, I love Petrangelo's game because he's just so good at both ends of the Theodore, the same thing on the Vegas Golden Knights side. Uh, and what I love about Pet- Petrangelo is Kachuk's trying to face wash him after the whistle and get him to retaliate and draw that penalty, especially when they were down 4-2 late in the game. And he's having none of that shit. He doesn't do anything. It's not because Vegas doesn't want to punch his lights out. Kachuk gets under anyone's skin. It's that, hey, we don't want to put our team – we don't want to give this team life. We're going to beat them here in game one. We're not putting them on a late power play with four minutes to go. When we're clearly ahead in this hockey game. That's discipline right there to not retaliate. And Petrangelo was very good. Uh, with that. So, Paul, uh, who do you like in this series? Who do you think's taking it right now? Vegas up one nothing, but Florida is resilient. We know they won't go away. I will uh I will leave the uh, I will leave the smart betting to the guys who know about betting and that's for you, for those of you if you're watching, it's the guys in the other corners, not me. <laughs> but it, it I uh I I still think Florida can win it, but that's yeah. You know, that's just based on me going, I think Florida can win it. I, I I don't know how the numbers line up. I still think Florida's a really good team. So is Vegas. But uh, I'll, I'll still go with Florida at this point. There we go. All right, Paul, we'll let you go in a couple minutes. A co- two last things. One, your podcast. we got to let you plug that and promote that because I think it's excellent as a music fan. The Walrus was Paul. If you love the Beatles, my goodness, you got to listen to at least a few episodes of this. Um, it's great. And I love all kinds of music. I'm a 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s guy. Classic rock, classic hip-hop and rap from the 80s and 90s. I love it. Uh, 90s punk and alternative, like your Nirvana and your Smashing Pumpkins stuff, even a little heavy metal, especially the 80s, 90s stuff. Like, I'm all over the map. Dance music, I love. I mean, electronic, old and new. I'm all over the place. I just don't like country and classical. Those are the only two I just can't get into. Uh, for various reasons. I hate that they shove country music down our throats in this country, but that's another story. The podcast is terrific. You get so much great insight and just background on how they came up with the lyrics of all these epic Beatles songs throughout that great career that they had. And then some of their solo work as well. So the walrus was Paul hosted by this man, Paul Romanuk. check it out. And then of course, I have to bring up the scholastic books, the hockey superstars, because I'm that kid at St. Bernadette in the mid nineties going to book fairs. And the first thing I'd look for is hockey superstars written by this guy, uh, Paul Romanuk. Just, it was, you know, p- uh, pictures of your favorite hockey players from those eras. And the books are still going today, by the way, right up into two. And you're still contributing to that. The hockey superstars books uh, that have just, I was bought them as a kid at the book fairs in the nineties and they're still going strong today. So talk about your work with those two things. Well, the uh, the book uh, is, uh, is still going strong. It's been over 35 years, <clears throat> and it's at the stage now where I have uh, people who got the book as a kid at book fairs uh, and in bookstores as well, But uh, and they now buy it for their kids. So that's when you know you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I started doing it back in the back in the 80s for Scholastic Publishing, uh, and it's really simple. It's uh, it's for young readers. Uh, it's for the young hockey fan in your life who's sort of you know seven to 12, 13 years old. Big color picture which kids love, and it's a story about the player uh, on the other side of the picture. And it's an annual. It comes out every year to preview the season, uh, and has been since the 80s. And it still sells very well. And uh, and it's it's always. Uh, I used to get handwritten letters from little kids who read the book, uh, which would be, you know, which was very cute. Uh, And of course, in this day and age, uh, they'll uh, now I'll get an email. So it's things have modernized a little bit, but it's still great hearing from little kids uh, who who are turned on to hockey. And and it's also helping them learn to read, which is cool. And then the music podcast is just sort of a fun thing that I've done uh, after things uh, blew up at Sportsnet. I wanted to I'd love the craft of broadcasting. 
uh, and uh, I just I wanted to do something, but I was sort of hockeyed out and sports out at the time, and I wanted to do something that was that was sort of a, a step away from that. I'm also a huge music fan and a big Beatles fan, so I came up with the podcast where I talk to musicians about their favorite Beatles music, Beatles albums, uh, and I've had some great musicians on. The guys from Blue Rodeo have been on. Stephen Page from the X of the Bare Naked Ladies has oh, been yeah. on. Uh, the great Ron Sexsmith has been on. So it, it's been a lot of fun to do that and uh, was lucky enough to win the, uh, the best uh, Canadian uh, music podcast of the year at the, the 2022 Canadian Podcast Awards. So that was really gratifying. Wow. And I'm still uh, churning those out. So that's that's but that's just that's just a fun thing. It's uh, just it's really nice to, to keep the broadcasting chops uh, chopping and uh, and talk to some people about some great music. So I really enjoyed that. It's called The Walrus Was Paul. You can get it wherever fine podcasts are available. And you can look for me on Twitter at Romanuk Paul is the handle. Great stuff. And that's, of course, where you can find the Ice Guys, too. All the great I, – I it takes me 30 minutes to rhyme off all these freaking platforms, Google Podcasts, <laughs> Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. It's ingrained in my brain now because we always end the show uh, saying that. But, yeah, check out The Walrus Was Paul. The Ice Guys is on all those platforms as well. So uh, it is definitely worth a uh, listen. And we'll end it with this. Um, it's a travesty. You're still not doing it uh, and still not on television because uh, you did an outstanding job, an outstanding career. But it is what it is, as uh, my friend Gabe Morenzi says. And uh, you had a great career, though, a terrific run, 20 plus years, got to do NHL uh, for Hockey Night in Canada, conference finals and uh, a, a wonderful career and a great just great to hear about it here on the uh, show today with uh, Paul Romanuk, our guest. Uh, Paul, we'll let you go. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us here. And uh, we wish you all the, the best in the future and maybe get you back on the show down the road. Anytime. It has been my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was great talking about the old days. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Paul. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us uh, on the Ice Guys show. Uh, there he is, Paul Romanuk, uh, of course, longtime TSN Sportsnet Hockey Night in Canada. Uh, we appreciate Paul Romanuk uh, joining us here on the Ice Guys show. Uh, all right. This has been a long one, and I knew it would be because there was just so much I wanted to get into. I, I knew it would be closing in on two hours, but here we go. This was a uh, – I wanted to get into as much as possible because Paul's career is uh, definitely lots of stories, and you heard a bunch of them. Uh, just an incredible interview, too. So if you missed it, uh, make sure you uh, check it out. Uh, we will be back to wrap up the show with Best Bets. Uh, hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube. Reminder about the BetCast tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, DM me on Twitter at Bobano or email Bobano350 at gmail.com. We'll send you the link for the BetCast if you want to join us tonight for Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Final. We'll be back to wrap up the show with Best Bets coming up in just a moment right after we hear from our both, both of our sponsors, Gramco and Manscaped. Support for the Ice Gas is brought to you by Gramco. Whether you or your team's game is on the field, screen, racetrack, court, or the ice, Gramco is for the game. Grown by farmers who spent years developing premium hemp genetics, Gramco provides customers with consistent quality Delta 8 THC products ready for any occasion. Gramco currently offers numerous Delta 8 products, including vape cartridges, disposable vapes, pre-rolls, gummies, wake and bake coffee, and more. Gramco offers an enjoyable, legal high delivered discreetly and directly to you. Gramco is also available at many American retailers as well. You can get the best Delta 8 cannabis products on the market shipped quickly and discreetly from Gramco. And if you visit www.thegramco.com, use promo code ICEGUYS, you will get 20% off of every order. And any order that's on the site over $50 will be shipped free with standard shipping. So live elevated with Gramco and check out their wonderful Delta 8 products today. Support for the Ice Guys is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Their products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package, the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the promo code ICEGUYS. That's promo code I-C-E-G-U-Y-S at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, it's about 14 million balls that you can preserve. The Performance Package 4.0 is the complete accessory package to take care of everything that is required. You've got, of course, the Lawnmower 4.0. 
takes care of your facial hair. Uh, and among other things, uh, you've got, of course, the weed whacker. I'm approaching 40. Nose hair has become a major issue. It pisses the hell out of me. I need to take care of that shit. And the weed whacker can help you do that. Both of these products, waterproof and a 4000K LED spotlight for a more precise shave. And you'll also be able to take care of those delicate areas with the ball toner with the ball deodorant keep you smelling good looking good and feeling good down in the nether regions this complete performance package 4.0 will take care of everything for you for all you guys out there and it's courtesy of our good friends at manscape.com so get 20 percent off and free shipping with the promo code ice guys at manscape.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscape.com and use promo code ICE Guys. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. All right, and it is time to put a wrap on this uh, extended edition uh, of the ICE Guys for this uh, Monday with Best Bets. Uh, Alex, we'll start with you. What do you like for Best Bet? Yeah, let's go with the draw, plus 325 tonight. Like I said, this is going to be, a, I think, a tighter game, a cleaner game, and I think we're going to see uh, the defense be a, a bit more prevalent here uh, throughout the 60 minutes and beyond. So let's go with Vegas and Florida to go to overtime. It's a regulation draw, the three-way draw, uh, plus 325. That's my best bet for game two. There you go. Florida-Vegas draw, plus 325. Best bet for uh, Alex B. Smith. Kevin, uh, what do you got for best bet? Yeah, I'm going with the under. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to slide that up to under six. So I get minus 128 to play that under six. Uh, you know, some people wonder if Bravosky would have a little bit of rust. I, I think, you know, he, he looked great. He got beat on a, a little bit of a couple plays from the, from the point with traffic. I think Flora's is going to do a better job of taking that away, blocking shots. Uh, they're also not going to take, take a ton of penalties. So they're a bit loose in that first game. They're also a bit loose in some plays, just their defensive zone. So then they're going to go back to just, Getting Pucks out really clamped down, and uh, Aiden Hill looked really good too. So between the two two goalies uh, playing their best right now, I like the under six in this game. All right, like enough uh, the defenses to tighten up a little bit tonight is Kevin Beach, Florida Vegas under six uh, for his uh, best bet for uh, game number uh, two uh, tonight. Uh, my best bet for tonight, um, I'm going to go to the well with that first period over once again, just because it's been uh, a, a great run for first period overs, particularly in Vegas games. Uh, going back to the Dallas series, they're on a consecutive game, first period over streak. Um, uh, ultimately, the best of both worlds is full game stays under and the first period goes over uh, for Kevin's best bet and for mine. So we'll go with first period over, one and a half here uh, tonight for a best bet, minus 120. Uh, I like Florida too, but uh, plus 120, but decided I'm going to go with the uh, – the, um, total the first period total so over one and a half minus 120 the both teams to score probably is not a bad look in the first period rich h mentioned the first period draw as well i could see that as well i don't i don't hate those bets as well there are a bunch of props too i'll just be very brief and say that marsh is so point you know carlson point wa point barbashev point i mean those have been great bets on the vegas side i say you stick with them uh, here tonight uh, Riley Smith as well, by the way, because he's playing his former team to get a point. Those are good point prop bets for Vegas. For Florida, I think it starts and ends with Matthew Kachuk's got to have a better game. Not that he had a terrible game one, but he was kind of silent, quiet by his standards. So just him to score a goal. This feels like a Matthew Kachuk step up, do your clutch thing again, which you've done so many times here in the playoffs. So, you know, Matthew Kachuk to score a goal probably tonight could feels kind of feels like that night. I think you know, he was where, a bit. That sidetrack yeah. too on just trying to set the tone and, and yep. get in their face instead of actually play his game. So I think they're going to kind of reset and realize, hey, like, okay, we've 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 set the tone here. Let's let's play some hockey too. Yeah, a Montour goal from our guy Cuban Wayne Gretzky. You know, Montour shooting the puck a lot. Uh, all it takes is one to go in. So uh, for a little bit of a bargain bin uh, shot in the dark for goal scorer prop tonight. Yeah, I don't hate that. I'll recap all props and stuff for the betcast. We'll be on right at eight p.m. Eastern right at the top of the hour before the game starts. And the game won't start till 8.15, 8.20 or so. So we'll have a good 15, 20 minutes to like talk about everything we like for the game and still get some bets in uh, before the opening puck drops. So 8 p.m. Eastern, join us for the BetCast tonight. Uh, EM, DM or email me, uh, and we'll send you the link for the BetCast if you want to join us. A reminder, the Ice Guys uh, is live on Stanley Cup Final game days uh, for the uh, rest of the season. Uh, and a reminder, you can download the podcast if you miss the show live on all podcast platforms for Alex B. Smith.
Kevin Beach. Thanks to Paul Romanuk, our guest as well, for joining us today. It was a great interview. Check it out if you missed some of it. I'm Ian Cameron. Have a great Monday. Enjoy the games and good luck. We'll see you in a few hours for the live BetCast for Game 2 tonight of the Stanley Cup Final presented by the Ice Guys and National Hockey Now. (laughs) 